The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. And if you want to learn about pastel painting, today's your day. We have William A. Schneider and Pastel Painting Secrets. <music> Good morning, I'm William Schneider and welcome to this DVD. Today we're going to be doing a pastel on a sanded surface and when I paint, and I encourage all my students to do this, I always wear a hat. And it's not because I'm shy about my chrome dome, nor is it because it's my trademark, but really it's because when I wear a hat, it keeps my pupils more open which lets me have a more diffused uh, focus in my vision, which is good, and it lets me see color better, which is also good. So I encourage people to wear a hat, or if you have hair issues, wear a visor. I tell my students this all the time. So today we're going to be working in pastel, and we're going to do really a light and shadow painting. So I'm going to use the shadow pattern to create the illusion of three-dimensionality on this two-dimensional surface. So let me talk a little bit about the surface. What I'm using here today is a piece of Kitty Wallace sanded paper, which has been affixed uh, by a company called Dakota Art Pastels. They attach it to a uh, museum board, so it becomes a rigid kind of surface. I love that. Apparently Kitty Wallace has been having some production issues, so you can't get this paper easily anymore. But Dakota also fixes uh, UART paper, which is another kind of sanded paper, to this sort of surface, and it works almost as well. Kitty Wallace is really nice because it's so even. Working on a sanded surface, uh, the pastel really holds, and you can put many layers on here, and you'll see that as this progresses. It also does something else. If you blend, as I do, it eats up your pastel, it also eats up your finger. So for years, I tried to find some way that I could protect my hand. So I tried styrofoam peanuts. They made a god-awful sound. You know, ur, 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 ur. And it didn't do the job the way I wanted because it scraped off a lot of the pastel. Then I tried pipe insulation, you know, the foam pipe insulation. That was better to, to blend things in. But the best thing I found was these cheap vinyl gloves. They gotta be vinyl, not latex, because the latex isn't hard enough. You can get these at Costco or other discount places, and you want them to be fairly tight. And this allows me to use my hand, and it feels almost like my hand. The only downside is if you're doing this and it's warm, your hand starts to sweat and you get pruny fingers. But that's better than bleeding fingers. What I'm gonna do Let's try to have our model lowly. Can you turn your head just a little bit? Perfect. And I've got her set up against a dark background, so it's going to be a light against darks. But on the shadow side, we have these uh, silk flowers that kind of create a light pattern. So I'm thinking design. I'm going to do this as a vignette, so I'm not going to fill this, this uh, surface from corner to corner but I want to have some sort of a pleasing motion in here other than just a head floating in space. 
the first thing I'm going to do is try to figure out what is the color of her flesh in the light. And in order to do that, I really need to know what is the temperature of the light. Is it warm or is it cool? What we have here is really cool light. So it's leaning more towards the blue, greenish end of the spectrum rather than the red, orangey end of the spectrum. So with cool light, we're going to have warm shadows. So I need to get the temperature of the light right off the bat. So as I start to work, I'm going to start out with a blue, believe it or not. And I'm trying to figure out where her face should be. So this, this is going to go kind of across this way. So I think her face will be like right here. I know what you're thinking. That doesn't look like flesh at all. But it'll get there. We're going to build this up in layers. So I see she's got some pinker color but that blue is modifying it and I'm using the flat side of my pastel as if this were a, a one inch brush I studied with Harley Brown I took a series of workshops with him and uh, he really taught me to use the side of the pastels and to blend. When I was in art school, I'd use the tip and make little cross hatching marks, and then it never looked right. And the blending gives you the effect of skin. Skin is smooth, it doesn't have a lot of little cross hatchings on it. So I'm trying to get the value and the temperature of the skin. And I'm thinking that I'm getting that a little too light right off the bat and I see that she has some more creamier areas down especially down here especially across the top and it's a little pinker Go to my sennelier. I didn't really talk about my pastels. And what I have here, since I've traveled to shoot this, I have a few boxes of pastels that I can wrap up with bubble pack and stick in my luggage. When I'm at home, I would have, you know, 500 different sticks out. And here's the deal with pastel. No matter how many colors you have, you never have exactly the right color. But it's okay. If we have the right value and the right temperature, the color can be almost anything. So, she's a little pinker right through here. And the bottom part of her head, I, I'm seeing a lot of green. So I'm going to put some of that in. I'm not painting the shadow pattern yet. I'm trying to just do the skin and the light. That's a little dark. So all I'm trying to do is kind of adjust things as I go. And then I'm going to pull this together by blending with my hand. I'm trying to depict not just the local color, but the local color and the light key. And I'll worry about the shadows in a while. But it's starting to fill in from a distance. I think 
And this is a little greener here. It's, and the green has a little more yellow in it than that. Now with the, uh, the issue of seeing these colors, color presents two problems. One, how do you mix the color, which I'm kind of mixing on my surface, but two, how do you see the color? If you stare at a color, your retina starts to produce the complement, and you can prove this to yourself. Take a really bright red, put it under a light, and hold it there for 30 seconds and time yourself and just stare without blinking and then cover your eyes and close them and you will see whatever you were staring at in blue-green. So your eye produces the complement. When you look at subtle colors like some of these color shifts on her cheek and forehead and so on, if you stare at it that little bit of complement immediately grays it out and the color goes away. So you have to kind of glance for color and trust that what you're seeing, you know, what you thought you saw, you actually saw. Because if you stare at it, which is the normal human tendency, uh, forget about it. So, I think I almost have this. Okay, so now I'm going to pull this together. The, the best blending tool is if you make a fist, this part of your hand sticks out, and it is absolutely perfect for doing this. It's like the Karate Kid. Pastel on, pastel off. And I'll talk about the pastel off in a little while too. But this lets me keep the character of the color in each of those areas and get kind of a blended effect. Flesh is, uh, is an interesting substance. When we look at skin, we really see three levels. You see into the skin, and in fact through the skin because it's translucent. So you'll see bone where it's close to the surface, like at the top of the cheekbones and the, you know, the bridge of the nose and a couple of other places. So you see the, the bone color kind of showing through. You also see blood vessels, which is why areas that are rich with blood vessels, like the nose, keeps us from having our nose get frostbite when we're out in northern climates. You know, you see the blood vessels showing through, which give it a, a redder color. And you start to see uh, other things, if you're doing a male, you'll start to see into the flesh and see the beard stubble underneath the skin. So you see into and through the skin, you also see the color of the skin itself. So Loli has a very fair complexion, although there's a little bit of, uh, I see a little bit of ochery color, you know, kind of that ruddy complexion. I am Norwegian and Irish, which means I should have stayed out of the sun more when I was younger. So anyway, if somebody was African American, they would have a lot more melanin in their skin. So the local color of the skin surface would be, uh, you know, darker. So you see through the skin, you also see the color of the skin itself. And then on the very surface, you see the reflections of the light source. So you've got three levels on skin. And pastel really lends itself to capturing that. Because as I'm layering this, what's actually happening is we're getting microscopic particles that are sitting next to each other. And they're kind of creating the same sort of vibrations that the Impressionists had with, with their little splotches of color. And it gives the effect of translucent skin. I love pastel. I keep trying to educate the art collectors that they think that pastel is not as permanent as oil. It's actually more permanent. What I do today will look exactly the same in 500 years.
unless you store it right in direct sunlight. Every single oil painting made will have at least cracked a little bit, regardless of how thin and how diligently the layers were applied. They have pastels from the 1600s at the Art Institute in Chicago. And, you know, some of those look like they were painted yesterday. So now what I'm going to do is set up my drawing right on top of this. And because I've put it on fairly thinly and then rubbed it in, this is a very, very thin surface. So I'm going to do this with vine charcoal. And I'm going to try to get the proportions that I see. So I want to make her head about this height. So I'm going to put her chin down here. I'm using my hand to measure this because I don't want the head to get too big. And I'm going to, I'm sort of drawing in a generalized shape for the skull. But I'm not even going to use, I'm going to redraw this later, but I want to at least get a starting point. It's probably too wide. It's probably more like this. And as I'm doing this, I'm using straight lines wherever possible. I studied at the American Academy with Bill Parks, the legendary Bill Parks, who one of the greatest life drawing teachers and human beings of all time. Certainly in the art world, he's taught a lot of people that uh, are making their mark today. But he used to say, see how straight you can make the round. If you do straight lines, it'll be more accurate and more powerful than if you try to do curves. So, what I want to do is establish a center line just to get the angle of the head. And I see that it's not straight up and down. If you think of the hour hand and the clock, if this is 12 o'clock and this is 3 o'clock and this is 6 o'clock and over here is 9 o'clock, you know, what is that angle? Well, it's not quite 12 o'clock. It's, it's more like 11.50. <laughs> or something. It's a little bit off of that 12 o'clock angle. But I, I'm going to put that center line in just so I hang the features in the same line. So the first measurement, I'm measuring from the base of her chin to the inside corners of her eyes. And I'm going to compare that to inside corner of eye to top of head. And the reason I do that is because on the average person, that average distance is 50-50. And on her, it's exactly 50-50. Often that's not the case. You know, she's got her hair kind of slicked down close to her head. If it was piled up a little bit, the top of my visual field would be a little bit higher. But I can put my measuring stick right on here and make the bottom equal the top. So I'm moving my thumb And so I think her eyes are, the corners of the eyes are right at that point and they're not exactly level because her head is tilted just slightly, which I like. So it's, it's not at three o'clock, it's at 2.52. Not really, but you know, there's a difference between accuracy and precision. I'm trying to be generally accurate, but not precise. So if I measure and get the right parts in the right place and they generally are right, uh, I will refine it as I'm painting. And you always want to step back, look at your effort from a distance. So I'm doing that. Next, I'm going to estimate where the eyebrows are. And I, my guess is that they're like right here, but I don't want to guess. I want to measure. So from top of eyebrow, peak of eyebrows 
top of head, if that's one unit, going down it's one, about one and a half. So if this is one unit, one, well, that means the eyebrows, I think, are a little bit higher. So one unit, one, maybe a touch higher still. Wow. See, I never would have guessed that. Just estimating by eye. Okay, that's where I think her eyebrows are. And they are on pretty much the same angle. So I'm just using my paintbrush measuring stick as a straight edge. So now I'm going to measure from peak of eyebrow to base of nose compared to base of nose to chin. And what I see is that the bottom part is just a little tiny scooch longer than the top part. So it's not exactly 50-50, it's almost. That's about right. I don't usually get them right on the first blush. So what I'm doing is building the vertical measurements. So the next measurement is from base of nose to the bottom of the lower lip. Again, on the average face, that's 50-50. But the way she differs from the average is what makes her look like her. So I'm going to try to capture that. And I see that she's a little bit longer on the bottom part than the top part. So... Maybe not quite that long. I think that's about right. So I think the bottom of her lower lip is right there. And then I can estimate, because I have enough stuff in here, that I can guess that the top of the lower lip is right about there. And the upper lip is right about there. So now I need to find horizontal measurements. And they should be in the same proportion. This is, is sort of the tricky part. I, I didn't think it should be tricky, but when I teach workshops, I found that a lot of times students have trouble getting this. So the thing that links the vertical and the horizontal I'm going to measure the distance between the corner of her eye using my measuring stick. And then on her, I'm turning that, and I see that it's about, it's a little scooch shorter than the distance from chin to lower lip. Because on the average person, this distance, bottom of lip to bottom of chin, is one eye width and we're about one eye width in between. And because she's looking right at me, that is symmetrically placed on either side of that center line. So now, I've got the corners of the eyes. Then I can measure the width of the eyes and compare them to that space in between and on her. Here are very symmetrical, which is probably, symmetrical is generally better than non-symmetrical, although we're all non-symmetrical to some degree. But I think her eye is like that. And then I asked myself, is that outer corner in line with, above, or below the inner corner of her eye? And if I can't tell, I put my straight edge on that. And I think it's slightly above, but, but basically following the line that defined the angle of those inner corners anyway. So I think the corner of her eye goes to right there. 
and when we measure the other eye. And that's maybe one little tiny scooch less than this. I think the outer corner is kind of straight across. So that now I have the width of the eyes, then I can start lining things up. Um, I think I'll I will actually draw in the upper lid at least a little bit, and I'm you can't see me from the camera, but I'm kind of squinting at her already. For shape and edge and value, we want to squint and compare. And so when I squint, those eyes are really soft. So I'm using the side of my charcoal rather than the tip because I want sort of an indefinite line right from the beginning so that I don't uh, mess myself up and paint this too hard. I'm estimating the iris. And then I'm going to draw this other eye. And I want to make sure that these eyes line up. So I'm looking at the tops of the eyes. They, they follow this line. So the top of this eye is going to be like right here. This is very prosaic, very non-artsy, which is why when I teach my workshops, I have a variety of students. I get professional artists, I get amateur artists, I get doctors, I get lawyers, I get carpenters, I get all kinds of different people that take workshops. You know who gets this instantly? The carpenters. Because I tell them, I want you to measure, and they say, I can measure. You know who has the most trouble? The artists. Because we artists want to be artistic. We want to be free and flamboyant, not measuring. But I learned through many years of bitter experience, if I don't measure, if I just want to get to the fun part fast and skimp on the measuring, then when I start painting, I've got the right parts in the wrong place. And then I try to correct it. And I spend so much time correcting that the fun part turns into the non-fun part. So I've learned it's better to do it this way. And this is what they taught me at the American Academy. So now I can start to measure the wing of her nose, which is right below this. And the wing of the nose on this side is really hidden in that shadow pattern. But I can see that it's right about in line with this one. And I'm going to have to put on my glasses. I had perfect vision until just a few years ago. And my far vision is still pretty decent. But I've got to use these readers nowadays. So that's starting to line up. Okay, so the corner of her mouth is right straight below the edge of the iris. So it's in a line here. I'm, I'm dropping, in essence, a plumb line. You can have your mouth relaxed like that. Does your mouth normally open a little bit when you're relaxed? Yeah, let it be that way. Actually, painting women with slightly parted lips is a very, it's a good look in general. It's kind of a, a sensuous look as opposed to the tight-lipped, from school marm.
And this corner of the mouth is straight below the left side of this iris. So like right here. So now I have to judge. Does that look kind of right to me? I think so. I think this, let this eye get a little up. Okay, now the outer edge that I put in in the beginning to kind of find my center line isn't in the right spot. Um, I'm really doing this measurement from the inside working out. So now I'm going to measure on her from right below her nose to the edge of the cheek. And I'm going to compare it to something on the vertical. And I see that it's a little bit shorter than nose to eyebrow. It's like here. Is that right? Let me try that again. Yeah, okay. So it's a little bit shorter than this, which means that the edge of her cheek is actually right here. And then I can say to myself, self, what is that angle? Well, it's not 12 o'clock. It's not one o'clock, but it's maybe 1230-ish. So I think that the side of her cheek goes like this. So I'm just making a, a line to indicate that. And where does it start to turn for the jaw? Well, right about in line with her lips. Like, so right here, it starts to really change direction. And then it goes to like 115 or so, right there. And notice I'm making these as straight lines. And the laziest way to do it is to use my measuring tool as a straight edge. Schneider's rule of art, the laziest way is the best way. So where is the corner of her chin? Well, that's lining up really just inside this nostril. So down here, there's going to be a one segment that goes to there. And I'm simplifying a curve into this tangent. So this will give me more the shape of her face, I think. And the deal with all of this measurement is you do it as best you can while measuring, and then you get back and look at it from eight or 10 feet back and figure out what adjustments you need to make. But I want to get the measurements in here first. So I'm going to find the other cheek. I see that that other cheek is actually a little bit longer. That distance is like just above the nose to the peak of the eyebrow. I wouldn't have guessed that. So this jaw, this cheek is actually out here. And what is that angle? It's not 12, it's like 1115. So I think it's kind of, what I'm not doing is this, trying to bring it over, because as I do that, I'll, I'll rotate my arm. Our arms are perfectly designed so that the lower portion will rotate easily. It's got two bones radius and the ulna, and they allow and facilitate that kind of motion. So it's better to estimate that angle and then try to put it in. 
And where does that side start to turn? Well, that starts to turn actually a little bit higher, like right here. So then it rotates to 1050-ish right here. Is that, where does that switch? Yeah, I think like right here. And then the corner of this chin lines up just inside the corner of the eye. So right to there. And then It goes like this. And then this connects it. So then, where do her ears intersect? This is so non-artsy. It's like building a table or something. But but at least the instructions are in English. If you go to Ikea, you get them in some other language or some place where English was not the first language. So I think that ear goes like that and I think this ear is out here somewhere. And then the peak of her hairline is right above the inside corner of this eye. And that distance equals this distance. So I think her hairline is like right here. And where hair meets skin is always softer than you think it is. So I can start to estimate that. Estimate that. I can start to put these eyebrows in a little bit. I need enough information. This kind of angles down a little bit and the peak is like right here. And I find it helpful to suggest the shadow under the jaw or the cheekbone, the zygomatic arch, just so I know where that goes. That gives me a sense of volume. And then how wide is she from ear to ear compared to the vertical? Because that'll give me the overall shape. I'm just checking this because as I'm doing it, I, it looks like I've made her face too round. I'll probably have to adjust that, but we'll see. So that's about right. Okay. So this side of her hairline So from the corner of this eye to the hairline is actually about 3 quarters of an eye width which amazingly enough is right where I had it which surprises me How about this eye See, I'm just comparing one thing to another to get the angles right and the distances right. It has to end up being right. This one is a little bit less. So again, it comes to like right here, but then this hairline angles in a little bit, starting right down about here. So it's on that line. This hairline angles in. It's not 12 o'clock. It's about 12.20. So it kind of goes like this. And since this is an indefinite shape, I'm making it indefinite. Now, the more correct information I have on my surface, 
then I can start to kind of estimate some things. So this, and it goes like that. And then down, and this comes almost straight down, but in a somewhat of an angle this way. The top of her ear, her ears line up just below the inner corner, so that they're like right here. This kind of goes almost straight up and down. So now, one last thing. I'm going to estimate where her neck intersects with her chin, and I see that it's straight below the corner of the eye. So when I put that, and that, what is the angle of the neck? Well, it kind of is a slight angle like this. We're actually seeing part of uh, a muscle that goes from the back of the, the skull right here behind the ear down to the breastbone, the sternum. It's a sternum, sternum, sternomastoid muscle. Where does it intersect over here? Right in, right outside this eye. So like right here. And that angle is like this as well. So now I've got enough information. I can get back a little ways and look at this, look at her, look at this, look at her. Because at this point, there has to be some adjustment. I'm, I'm never right on and I'm not right on with this. I think I missed this angle in the first place. I think it's more of an angle like this because I've, I've made her face look too full. And so then when it starts to turn, it's more turning from here and then like this. So I can arrange, erase this stuff. That means the ear is there, not here. So there's always a correction. So we're trying to be as accurate as we can, but you know, not agonizing over it. until we get, till we make our adjustments. So that looks more like the shape of her face to me. And since I'm not doing this demo as a commission portrait, if I was doing this and somebody was paying me to do their portrait, I would spend more time on the measurement. I would actually probably do pretty much what I'm doing today but then I would take some photos and really correct and uh, get some of these measurements much more accurate. But now, now that's starting to look a little better. And how does that look from here? I would say close enough for rock and roll. Or as my dad used to say, close enough for government work. I do want to find her shoulder. Shoulder, the back of the muscle, it's actually the, the back muscle, it's the trapezius, is joining the neck slightly below the chin. So like right here at an angle like this. And this is like right down here. Because of the rotation, there's a difference in the two sides. And that's important. You know, if we can have slightly different angles, it makes the painting more interesting. So how far down does her neckline go? So this is like from here to the hairline. like right here, 
center point lines up here. It's like you're triangulating mortar fire or something. You're trying to get the general angle of some of these. So why don't we take a break? Good job. Good. I, I still think I have this cheek a little wide. Yeah. That's why it's so important as artists to take break or for artists to take breaks. And when you take the break, get away from your painting. So you do have that fresh eye. Okay, that looks more accurate to me. Not trying to be stylized. I'm not trying to do much of anything other than just be honest and accurate to what I see in front of me. And let me find the pit of her neck. I see that that is about that far below her chin, which happens to be exactly this. And where does that line up? Lines up with her iris here. So I think the pit of her neck is down here. Now I haven't talked about this. If you're working in pastel, you want to make a dust trough. And some people, I've seen people try to use like aluminum foil, which gets all wrinkled up and then it catches in parts. I find that the best thing is just a sheet of newsprint. And I just use old newspapers. Stick one sheet under the top sheet here. I do have padding behind my painting surface. Uh, particularly if you're just using paper, you want to have that padding because otherwise you'll start to pick up an impression of your drawing board. So, uh, got the padding behind and then on top of the last bit of padding and right under the top sheet, I put the dust trough and then I just fold it up because when I'm done, I'll just roll that up, throw it in the garbage and I'm done with it. And I'm not going to blow the pastel, I'm going to tap the surface like this to get the dust to come off because I don't want liver cancer. And that stuff is, they say it's non-toxic. I'm not totally sure that I believe it. Um, so in any case. So what have we got now? I think that this drawing is acceptable. And it's worth noting, I, I hope you can see this. I have not drawn an outline around that mouth. If you look at the mouth, it's really five marks. The bottom of the lower lip, the center point, the top of the upper lip, and the two corners. And yet, it reads as a mouth already. We, as human beings, learn to think in terms of symbols. And so, as artists, we have to become as infants in our view of the world. Must become as little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. What? What I mean is, uh, if you look at, or if you ask a, a four-year-old to draw an eye, they'll probably draw an oval with a circle in it. If you ask a 60-year-old who is not an artist to draw an eye, they'll draw the same symbol. They learn the symbol and just repeat it. Um, as artists, if we draw symbols instead of shapes, we create something that doesn't look like reality. It looks like a shorthand of our thought process. 
And so we want to break these symbols. The way to break the I symbol is to not draw the lower lid. So you don't make, you don't complete the oval. Then the left brain says, well, wait a minute, that's not what an eye is. An eye is an oval with a circle in it. Or if, if you're an artist, you refine it so it's a trapezoid with a circle in it or something. But if you break that symbol, then the left brain starts to say, I can't deal with this, I'm out of here. And the lowly little right brain comes and says, well, I can see that this shape kind of goes up like this and it goes like that and then the partial shape here, especially if I squint, a little bit of something there. This is so soft, it kind of bleeds into the corner. But the right brain can copy shapes. It doesn't know the names for things. Same thing with a mouth. If you draw an outline for a mouth, you've frozen it and made it hard and it's it's particularly difficult when you're painting women because the women put stuff on their lips that has a sharper edge. But if you squint down, what I'm gonna suggest right now is that as you're painting at this point, you define by squinting, what is the sharpest edge that I see up there? And I'm making that judgment right now and I think the sharpest edge is actually the edge of her blouse right here. So I'm going to indicate that. And I'm going to indicate it in pastel so that I remind myself to look at that. As a point of comparison, I'm going to compare all edges to that edge. So if I'm still squinting and I see that sharp edge and then look up at her eyes while I'm squinting, they are just whisper soft. They're just sort of dark smears compared to that edge. If I paint that relationship, this will look more like her. If I freeze the eyes and make them hard, uh, she's going to look like she's been taken over by an alien force or a Stepford wife or something, but not a human being. Same thing with the lips. Eyes and mouths are always in motion and if we freeze them, it's nasty. So we don't want to do that. Okay, so I've got the sharpest edge. What is the lightest light that I see up there? As you're looking at this DVD, what do you think is the lightest light? And I know people will say, well, it's, I see a light on her forehead and there's a, it's light down here. And then I will ask, is any of that as light as those artificial flowers behind her? No. And so that's the lightest light. It may not be on the model at all. So I'm gonna put that in just to have that comparison. I'm now gonna compare all my lights. See how dark that made this stuff look? I'm gonna soften this edge a little bit just so I remember that that's not my sharpest edge. It's pretty close over here, but I've got the lightest light there, the sharpest edge here. What is the darkest dark that I see? And again, I have to squint and compare. One of the adverse effects of aging, presbyopia sucks, is that wearing these readers, I can't squint properly because my eyes keep trying to focus on the glasses. So I take them on, or put them on, take them off, put them on, take them off. So what is the darkest dark that I see in my field of vision? And I'm looking all around. It's not in her hair, although it's pretty dark over here, but that's lighter than stuff in her blouse. Since I'm going to do this as a vignette, I want to make sure that I'm not overstating things, but I think that the darkest dark is like right here. That's darker than 
the backdrop behind the vase back there. So I think it's like kind of right there. So I'm going to put that in. And remember what we said in the beginning? I asked myself, self, what is the temperature of the light? And my answer was, it was cool light. So cool light produces warm shadows. But the deepest recesses, regardless of the temperature of the light, are always hot. So that's, that's not dark enough. I want something that's darker than the edge of the, the blouse here. But it's going to be a warm dark. That's not dark enough either. Nor is that. So I'm going to lay some black over it. So now I've got my darkest dark. So I'm going to compare all the darks to this dark. And it's not even on her. It's, it's going to be in kind of the vignette area. Now, if there was an intense color, I might include it. And the question is, do I consider her hair intense enough to be a high chroma color? Hmm. You know, I think I may put a little of that in. Now, since it's a dark, when I toned the canvas or toned the support, I just kind of got the whole area. But if I start to try to put darks over this light stuff, it's going to mix with it and it's going to get more chalky. So I'm going to get rid of some of that. So you push it in with your hand to get it into the tooth of the support. And if you take your paper towel and kind of fold it into a point, I can use that as like a little pick to get some of this stuff off, to loosen it. It's an annoying sound, isn't it? It's better than styrofoam peanuts. I'm getting rid of some of that. And it's going to be kind of dark behind here, too. So I want to get rid of some of that pastel. So I know what you're thinking. Saying, well, why didn't you just draw it first and then put it in? Because if I drew it first, I would be trying to very carefully put color in around the lines so I didn't lose them. Better to have, uh, there are no lines in nature. So better to have the drawing sitting on top of that surface. In nature, there are no lines. There's only one shape against another shape. To some extent, if you drew it once, you can draw it again. But a whole head like this, you saw how much time I spent on the drawing. So this will get rid of enough of that stuff that I can put it back in with pastel and it won't gunk it up. You can create some of the most beautiful paintings with pastels, but many artists have a hard time making their pastel paintings look just right. Pastel portraits are even more challenging, which is why we selected master artist William A. Schneider to show you the right way to use pastels to create realistic images in your portrait paintings. So if you've got background color, complement, and then discord somewhere near that center of interest, it will focus you in like a laser on the center of interest. Discovering how to select, apply, and blend colors will help you achieve an accurate representation of your model, whether from life or a photo. And Bill Schneider is a master at teaching this. So anyway, the question is, am I thinking about edges? To a certain extent, I am. I'm comparing everything to this sharpest edge, 
and I know that a form shadow as it rounds out is going to have softer edges than a cast shadow like the cast shadow of the nose. In this video, you will see Bill's best kept secrets and techniques for using pastels for portraits and we'll take you through a start to finish painting while explaining each step along the way. And so you can have somebody with one eye here and the other one down here and your brain will look at that and say, hmm, yeah, it looks pretty good to me, till the next day. That's why it's often, I often think that <clears throat> the evil painting trolls have come out and attacked my paintings at night. But it's really that I've got a fresh eye. And I'm coming back and seeing this. Watching Bill, an excellent instructor and passionate artist, you'll soon find yourself loving pastels just as much as he does, even if you've never used them before. You'll be able to pause and practice each technique until you're ready to move to the next segment. You will have many aha moments as you see Bill reveal his techniques that bring pastel paintings to life. We did a light and shadow painting in pastel. The shadow was bringing out the three-dimensionality of the form. So it's basically the difference between the value of the light and the value of the shadow. Having studied at the American Academy of Art in Chicago, Bill has been featured in many art magazines and journals and has received awards from prestigious art societies and organizations. You'll love Bill's artistic creativity and will treasure this video for years to come as you hone your own personal style for painting with pastels. Well, that was William A. Schneider and Pastel Painting Secrets, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with William Schneider. Well, we're here today with William Schneider, and we want to find out a little bit about his life and his career and his painting. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's nice to uh, spend some time with you. You and I had a, a little bit of an opportunity to get acquainted before this interview. Um, we've met at various events in the past. Um, I, I'd kind of be curious, starting from the very beginning, what, uh, what were the first things that made you get interested in art? Oh, I've been interested in art since I was a kid. Um, my great-grandfather was actually a, a pretty well-known sculptor. Really? What was his name? Christian Schneider. Uh -huh. And he did all of the uh, frieze work and the terracotta work for the Louis Sullivan buildings. Mm -hmm. So his, his work is on Lincoln Hall at the University of Illinois and the Lincoln Memorial in Springfield and the Carson Peary Scott Building and Second City and so on in Chicago. And uh, that made my family think that art was something that somebody could actually make a living at. And so they didn't discourage it. When I was nine, my grandparents bought me an oil painting set and said, go out and, and play with the oil paints, which I wouldn't do for a nine-year-old, <laughs> but they did. So I've, I've always had an interest in art, but then I had an interest in sports and music and you know, just all over the place. So let's stop and go back to your, this was your grandfather or your great-grandfather? Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Did you know him? No, I never did. Okay. He passed away before. I was conscious. I think that we overlap, but I was like two when he died. Your grandfather then, was he at all into art? He uh, was a photographer and owned a photo finishing business. And so kind of in the artsy end, but it, it, it was really a, a very more mundane business. You know, they'd pick up film from uh, various drug stores and grocery stores and wherever and bring them back and process the film and then ship them back out to the stores. Well, they wouldn't be in business today, would they, if they no. <laughs> had to do that? Not a lot of film going on today. So you got an oil painting set. They said, go out and paint. Did you do it? I did. And did you go outdoors or what did uh, you No, do? I went out to the back. They had my great grandfather's studio was still there and it was always just called the studio. Yeah. And so I never thought about an artist studio. I just thought that was the name of that building and uh -huh. so I would go there. And, and were there any remnants of that past in there? Were there old sculptures mm, that were not unfinished? Not really. There are terracotta pieces all over my grandfather's house, some of which I have now. Uh -huh. Oh, how wonderful. And, yeah. 
And, and did you ever have any desire to sculpt? I have done a little bit of sculpting. I, I discovered that sculpting is 10% art, 90% construction. Yeah. And <laughs> I wanted more immediate gratification. Yeah. It's Although I, I like it and I think that I might take that up again. Uh, but the way I would do it is do the clay, send it off and let somebody else deal with all of the rest of it. Oh, you mean the, the casting and... Yeah, the casting. Oh, yeah. That's I a uh, took a class from a guy named Amri Amrani, who mm -hmm. did the Michael Jordan statue that's famous in Chicago. And we, you know, made these elaborate sculptures over the, about an eight-week span. And then mm -hmm. we spent like the next 16 weeks making a mother mold and then finally casting it in, uh, in concrete. I, I would think the art part of it really is casting it, you know, creating it, and then the casting is a whole different art, so it makes yeah. sense. So uh, you painted a little bit as a little boy. Mm -hmm. um, first memories of museum visits or pieces that stood out to you? I took a couple of lessons when I was young. Uh -huh. and. Uh, you know, they had different contests when I was in grade school, you know, paint something for Poppy Day or whatever. And I seemed to do well in those and, and enjoyed that, enjoyed the recognition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it was raining out and I couldn't go outside and play, I could draw. I would draw things with my mom. And, uh, you know, that was about it. And then I took some lessons from a local artist. And then when I went to college, I, uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I became an art major at the University of Illinois and went from medical illustration to graphic design to fine art, and then I started playing in rock bands and couldn't handle getting up for the life drawing classes, so I switched <laughs> to something easy and I got a degree in psychology. That's easy? <laughs> compared to getting up and actually doing something for the art classes. <laughs> and so you, um you kind of abandoned your your painting art at that time and you went into a different form of art. Right. Tell me about that. Um, well, the highs are higher and the lows are lower than real life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was the, the late 60s going into the 70s. Um, I got in some bands that started to do pretty well regionally uh -huh. and, uh, you know, so it, it was fun. So you were... Uh, bass player. Yeah, bass and keyboards. And keyboards. And tell me the name of the bands. Um, the first band that did anything was the One Eyed Jacks. One Eyed Jacks. Right. right. And that was based in Champaign, Illinois. Uh -huh. And then uh, when we formed a band called Fat Water. Uh -huh. And that was different people from a, a group of other bands and put together. Uh, and then Fat Water got a, a record deal with MGM and uh, did that for a while, Fat Water broke up. I decided I should actually learn what I was doing, so I went back to music school. And uh, while I was in music school, joined a group called the Free Theater in Chicago, which was doing mixed media rock opera stuff, but it was kind of a quasi semi-professional organization, but it was headed by a guy named Bill Russo, who mm -hmm. used to be Stan Kenton's arranger of all things. Well but he had gotten into this mixed media rock opera stuff. And that's where I met my wife. And uh, so we left that after I graduated from music school and put together another band. And so the last band was called Freeze. Trees? Freeze. 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 And uh, you said you had a record deal with MGM with uh, one of the bands. Yeah. Did, did you guys ever get any airplay, sell any records? We got airplay, we sold records, we just didn't sell enough records. <laughs> Although, strangely enough, you can go on iTunes and download and order the Fat Water album to this day, or at least as of a few months ago you could. Because huh. a friend of mine mentioned to me that that was available and I said, what? You've got to be kidding. And you played bass and keyboards on that album? I played bass and I don't think I played keyboards on that. So you became a touring rock star and <laughs> wanted to, and basically did probably hundreds of gigs in a lot of different cities around for oh, years, yeah. right? Yep. And you lived on the road? Pretty much. And you had a young family at some point. You, got, you met your wife and got married and had, my understanding, you have five kids. Five kids. 
So did those kids go on the road with you? Sometimes. The, uh, we both were married previously. Mm -hmm. So she had a young daughter and I had a young son. My son was living with my ex-wife at that point in Cleveland. And so he was not with me most of the time. That must have been heartbreaking. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's very tough to not be around your kids. Yeah. When they're, especially when they're little like that. Yeah. But, uh, but he would come for visits and, uh, you know, and my wife's daughter who I adopted would go on the road with us from time to time, but mostly she would stay home with babysitters, especially when she was in school, uh -huh. you know, we had to keep her in school. Right. And uh, so then when my wife became pregnant with our first child together, uh, we were going to take a year off and then put the band back together. And then I, I got a straight job, a day job. And what was that? I was working in sales for a paper distributor. Okay. And uh, after a year, she had no interest in putting the band back together. And we decided we kind of liked having some money for a change. <laughs> and so... That was the end of my music career. So after the paper distributor, what happened? Um, I answered an ad for Kidder Peabody, uh -huh. which was a, a brokerage firm, and they ended up hiring me and training me. So I went into the financial business. I was a retail broker for a while, and then I switched over to the institutional side mm -hmm. and uh, became, they trained me in pension consulting. And I had a partner that he and I ran the uh, Midwest effort out of Chicago. And when Kidder was sold, we left and started our own firm. And so I did that for a few years, sold the firm, and went to art full time. So had you been doing art throughout this, th through these various years? Had you been doing any painting or studying? Uh, a little bit. I would do two paintings a year when I was in the music business. Mm -hmm. You can only follow one muse at a time, That's effectively. Right. Once you sold your business, is when you really started getting into it in a, in a big way. Well, actually prior to that, I started, I went to an exhibit at the Art Institute. It was called Monet in the 90s. This uh -huh. was like 1989. So they were gearing up for the 90s. And I went and said, wow, this, seeing the Rouen Cathedral series, I said, this is very cool. And I could do this. And so I started taking some lessons at, uh, initially at the School of the Art Institute. Uh, the School of the Art Institute was very much into abstract expressionist, modernist stuff. So the, the drawing teachers couldn't draw very well and the painting teachers didn't understand a lot of what I wanted to learn. So I left that and went over to the American Academy of Art in their Saturday program. And you studied with? Bill Parks. Bill Parks. Right. Legendary and, Bill Parks for so life drawing. For those who don't know, tell the Bill Parks story and some of the others that he trained. Um, Bill Parks trained a lot of the artists that are doing anything today. His students included Dan Gerhardt's, Rose Franson, Sue Lyons, Scott Burdick, Ramel Delatore, Thomas Blackshear, uh, you know, just a whole range of, of different artists. So he studied with Mosby, is that right? Correct. And Mosby is the one who taught Schmid. Right. Bill Parks and Richard Schmid were classmates. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, Bill Parks rescued an early, early Schmid painting from the garbage can and kept it for years and years, and he gave it to me before he died. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Richard will probably see this and want it back. <laughs> I'll trade him. So studying with Parks for how long? I went every Saturday for eight years. While you were working? While I was working. And then what was the transition out of the entrepreneurial side of your life into the painting side of your life? Well, initially when I started doing the painting, I was, I was just doing it for fun to have a creative outlet. And after a while, as my skills started to develop, and I started, uh, even while I was studying in the Saturday program, I started taking some workshops. I took a workshop from Harley Brown, and that was an eye-opener. And then I started taking workshops from other artists. And uh, as my skills developed, I started to realize, gee, I could, I, I'm as good as some of the things that I see in galleries. And I approached a couple of galleries, and I got in a regional one. 
Then I approached the Talisman Gallery in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, um, and Jody Kerberger turned me down. <laughs> he said, oh, I've got too many artists and I, I want to be able to sell enough, you know, to justify it and it just wouldn't work out and, you know, but thank you anyway. And I said, you know, I don't care how much you sell. It would just be an honor to be in your gallery. And for whatever reason, that, that meant something to her and she took me on. And that was my first gallery that actually was kind of a national gallery. And did it sell? Um, yeah, she sold pieces. Not like her heyday. The yeah. uh, Bartlesville used to be the headquarters of Phillips Petroleum. And so all of the Phillips Petroleum executives would come in there and buy paintings. She, she would sell, you know, she launched Richard Schmidt. She was his first major gallery, or at least that's what she alleges. Mm -hmm. But uh, great lady, great gallery. She was in business for 50 years, and then after the recession, or during the recession of 2008, you know, she shut that business down. Everything changed for everybody in, yeah. in that year. So uh, you studied uh, on workshops and Saturdays, and then and, and you're still going to work every day. There was a point at which you started going to work less yes. and uh, painting more. Yep. Tell me about that. Um, we sold the business in 2000. And the, the way we, we, we sold our pension consulting business to a company called National Financial Partners. And the way they work, they buy an operating company, but they turn around and have the selling principals set up a management company. And the management company has a permanent contract to manage the operating company. So um, we still had ownership, but it was an ownership of a different entity. And uh, at that point, I started cutting back. So first I went to four days a week so that I could do three days a week on my art. Then I went to three days a week. And then it kept cutting down, and then I finally just sold it several years ago. And I've been happy ever since. Oh, you weren't happy all that time? No, I was happy all that time. I enjoyed what I did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and you, you were pretty pretty good at it from what I can tell because I don't think you probably want to share numbers here, but you told me what you got the business level up to sounded like it was pretty impressive. Yeah, that, that company is going strong to this day. Mayo Schneider and Associates. And, and that, that must feel really great to know that something you started has continued. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm proud of, about that and happy about that, but I'm glad I'm doing art full time. Yeah, so you said something I wanted to probe. <clears throat> um, you went to a workshop with Harley. Yes. And you said it was a real eye opener. Tell me about that. Um, well, let me back up. When I was in Bill Park's class, after a while, he encouraged me to start using pastels in the class. And I said, I don't want to do pastel, I want to do oil paint. And he said, well, you can't do oil paint in this room. And so I bought a set of pastels and started doing pastels. And I was cross-hatching and, you know, doing, making little linear marks. When I went and studied with Harley, he had me break all my pastels in half and start using the broad side. Uh -huh. So my pastel technique really came from Harley Brown. Uh, but it reinforced a lot of what I'd learned at the American Academy. Um, but that it could be, that you could make pastels look like oil paintings. So Parks was a pastel teacher? No, Parks was a drawing teacher. He a taught life te drawing. Okay. He had, at one point, I think, taught painting and drawing and composition and a bunch of other things, but he was in his late 70s when I started with him, and he had pared everything down to just teaching life drawing hmm. because he said that was the most important thing. So there are principles and a way of drawing that you learned from him that you're still operating on. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. And Bill, Bill Parks... Uh, would repeat the same phrases over and over and over. And so I have his voice burned into my brain. Give me some examples. Um, okay. For those of you that get back and look at your effort from a distance, for those of you that don't, <laughs> I heard that 10,000 times. And he would do that and everybody would back up and look at, 
the piece get a new perspective. Uh, you know, a gesture drawing, you gesture, you start at the top, go to the bottom, find the midpoint, then work a little bit on each side, always looking, always comparing. That's Bill Park's voice coming out my mouth. So, well, he, that's he was a, a that's, great, great teacher. That's an, an, an essential in teaching is the repetition because we don't always get it the first or second or third or 50th time. Yeah, that's why I took so many workshops from Harley. So you have, um, uh, you have quite a bit of diversity in your work in the sense that so many of us have a tendency to focus on one thing and, and just trying to get good at one thing is difficult. Get good at oil painting for me is difficult, but you do oil painting and you do pastels. Do you do watercolor at all? I started trying to learn watercolor uh, several months ago and watercolor is totally backward. Right. You, you work from, you figure out where the light spaces are and then paint around them. Right. Unlike oil paint where you start with the darks and then end up with the lights. So right. I'm struggling with watercolor. I'm not ready to show any watercolors it's to anybody a, yet. It's a challenge. And so, uh, but, but still you, you do equal amounts of pastel and oil, yes? Yes. And you also have quite a bit of difference in the styles that you do because you, you have a lot of different approaches. You're, you're not stuck in one particular way of doing things. You know, in some cases you'll paint like, like Fashion, in another case you'll paint like Sargent, in another case you'll paint like you. So tell me a little bit about that. Is that a little hard to keep track of? And um, I, for whatever reason, I am blessed or cursed with left and right brains. Uh -huh. And so uh, as I've been trying to learn, and, and the, the beauty of art is that you can never stop learning. Right. I mean, you go every hill that you go over, there's another hill beyond it. And it's constant challenge. Constant challenge. But as I've been trying to, to learn, you know, what did the artists that I really admire do? I've sort of analyzed and then broken them down. So fashion was doing something much different than Sargent. You know, all the way from the Renaissance through the late 1800s, artists were trying to depict three-dimensional reality on a two-dimensional surface. And the main tool they had to, to deal with that was value. So they're doing light and shadow paintings and the shadow, the dark of the shadow is showing you where there's an undercut. The light is where something sticks out. Uh, starting in the late 1890s, artists started to become interested in other things. Fashion, I think, was mostly interested in suggestion. He was interested in contrast, I think, or at least this is what it seems to me. Uh, so he would have sharp contrast between smooth skin surface and broken strokes for the features. The further you get from the center of interest, the more broken things tend to become. Um, so it's a, it's a different focus. And so as I've tried to learn these things, I've, I've learned different techniques that seem appropriate to, uh, to that kind of an approach. But they end up ultimately getting integrated. Mm -hmm. You know, my, when I paint, my paintings do not look like Nikolai Fashion, uh, nor do my paintings look like Sargent. But, but use... I kind of integrate both light and shadow with broken tone, although I can isolate them and, and, and try to work on each one separately. Mm -hmm. For the student who is watching you for the first time, maybe hasn't taken a workshop from you yet, who is maybe not very experienced at all, talk about learning and the process that they should go through in learning. Uh, we talked last night about copying old masters, for instance, and you, you've learned Fashion and Sargent by copying their works, I assume, and, and also others. Can you, can you talk about what, the, what you think the appropriate learning process is? I think that the, the basic skill is drawing, and drawing at its core is really measurement. So when I teach workshops, you know, I'll have a workshop on broken stroke painting. But what I find is that I'm teaching half the students how to measure things. You know, what is the distance? 
from the bottom of the chin to the corner of the eye compared to the corner of the eye to the top of the head. Where are those eyes located relative to the, to the mass of the head? How long is the distance from the eyebrow to the nose compared to the nose to the base of the chin? These are all just proportional uh, kinds of measurements. And once people get the idea that they can measure proportions and get pretty skillful at that, then as artists we tend to learn value. You know, how dark are the shadows? What's your darkest dark? What's your lightest light? How light are the lights in the skin compared to the lightest light? How dark are the shadows compared to the darkest dark? So then we start to master value. Then the next rung is edges, I think. You know, how, how sharp is an edge? You know, if I squint down at you, I see a really razor sharp edge on your shirt. And if I keep squinting and look up at your eyes, they are just whisper soft. They're just sort of dark smears. Mm -hmm. So if I paint the relationship that I see when I squint, the edge relationship, it looks more natural. That's hard for people to learn because it's not human nature. Right. You know, when we look at somebody's eyes, we really stare at them so we can see them clearly and then we want to put them down on the canvas that way. And if you put sharp, hard edges on eyes and mouths, uh, at the best, it looks like a Stepford wife or something. <laughs> you know, it's, not, uh, it's not a good look because well, eyes and mouths are in motion constantly. And so if we freeze them and put hard edges on them, it doesn't look right. Right. Well, I've noticed in um, the various portraits that have been done of me by some of the greats, living greats, that that's very true. I haven't figured out how to do it myself. It's easier said than done. Uh, especially when working with a model because the tendency is to focus in on those eyes. But um, I noticed all the eyes are very soft in, yeah. in, the, in the better paintings anyway. And uh, so that's an interesting point. So if I'm a student, um, my first thing to master is drawing. Right. And what, it, it, you know, sometimes when, when I first started learning art, I didn't know it was out there. Uh, I didn't know about life drawing classes. I, you know, I basically you found out about the the old lady teaching painting at the YWCA or something, and that it, sometimes it's hard to know what to look for. So if someone's kind of entering in, what should they be looking for, and what should they focus on in the initial part of their their journey? I would say if you can find a good life drawing teacher. Um, absent that, if you can, we are very fortunate. Nowadays, you can study with experts from all over the country via DVDs or downloads or whatever. Uh, but there are some great, great uh, art instructors. The American Academy of Art in San Francisco has got a couple of really great drawing instructors, and they have books out and they have videos out, and you can kind of get those and, and learn. I would say, the biggest thing is mileage. If you draw 100 heads trying to measure, not doing it just by eye, but trying to actually measure uh, by the 100th hundred head, hundred head, it's going to be pretty good, or certainly better than the first one. In the Max Ginsburg video, Max talks about his process and the breakthrough for him was when he and his buddies hired a model um, and they started at five o'clock in the morning every day and uh, they got up every morning and, and did that model all day long, constantly. And he said, and, and you know, we would start and stop and do multiple drawings of that model. And he said, until I started getting a lot of mileage, until I was doing it every single day and doing it three or four times a day, you know, three or four different drawings a day. He said that's what really made the difference. His, his, his drawing skill went from here to, to way high in a very short period of time because he concentrated that effort. I, I think that's true. What I do and did even when I was working and do to this day, if I cannot paint during a day, at the very least, I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes drawing. And, and you can copy heads uh, out of Seventeen magazine or Allure or Glamour because they've got all of the makeup 
pictures, and mm -hmm. if you, you can measure, put a center line, measure the eyes, measure all of these different things on the reference, and just copy it into a notebook. And it, it's like doing scales on a piano. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to do that stuff, otherwise you start to lose it. So an artist really should carry um, a pocket notebook and a pencil, and every chance they possibly get, if they're waiting in line at a grocery store or anything else, just get it out and, and sketch. Yeah. The more you do, the better you get. Yeah. So the next step, okay, we've, we've gone through sketching. Is it appropriate to get into painting right away? Is it really important to master drawing first? Does it matter? Um, I think that it helps to start to get the proportions just using, you know, graphite and paper. Because if you start with oil right away, it tend, you tend to get too involved in the paint application process and how do I mix these colors and do I need the green handled brushes or the black handled ones or right. whatever. Uh, but I think that if once you've started to get the drawing skills, you don't have to uh, go to like an atelier sort of an approach where you're doing two years of drawing in charcoal from the plaster cast and then when you get really good at, at rendering three-dimensionality in charcoal, then you finally pick up a brush. I mean, it doesn't hurt to do that, but for the person that's trying to just uh, uh, be a good amateur, yeah, you know, that uh, approach is too grueling, and they'll they'll get bored and give it up. How they'll... do you know when when you found yourself as an artist? You 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 tend to paint more loosely, I think, than let's say the atelier style, which uh, the classic academic style, which would be very, very tight. Now, you may disagree with me. Um, and then some people paint much more loosely than you. How do you know you've found your style? How do you know that you've, you've pleased yourself? Um, you want to please yourself as you go along. And uh, if you try to find a style, I, I was given this advice early on. Bill Park said it, Dan yeah. Gerhardt has said it, others have said it as well. You know, just try to be as honest as you can in representing what you see uh, because painting is, is basically editing anyway. And if you try to be honest, your style will find you. Just like it, nobody's handwriting looks like anybody else's. Right. You know, ultimately you're going to paint like yourself. And if you try to paint like something else, I mean, you can try to learn from Fashion or you can try to learn from Zorn or Sargent, which I do, but I'm never going to paint like Sargent. I'm never going to paint like Fashion. It, it, nor should you. Nor do I want to. Right. You want to be yourself. Right. So what questions would you ask Zorn or Sargent or Fashion if you had five minutes with them in heaven? <laughs> or wherever they might be. <laughs> ah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I would ask him for a critique. Oh, what a great what a great answer. Yeah, because it, you know, if I just come up with some open ended question, that doesn't help me. I need to know. Okay, what would you do to this painting to make it better? And and I ask other artists that. You well, know. we we were talking last night about how um, I can't see things that others can see when I'm painting, and yet somebody else, my wife, will even come in and say, "Well, that eye's too high." I, and until she points it out, I don't even know it. That's why it helps to get a different perspective. So you know, to to get up, get away from your position and back up and look at it from a distance helps because it's a new perspective. Looking in a mirror is a new perspective. I have a black mirror, which is basically a piece of black plexiglass, and you put that over your eyes and then look up and see the reflection of the image. So it's darkened and inverted, gives you another new perspective. When you take breaks, don't sit and look at your painting. Go away, look at something else, and then come back. Try to have a fresh eye. Mm -hmm. There's a, a strange psychological phenomena, I think, that whatever we put on our canvas, if we leave it there very long, our brains accept that as gospel truth. 
setup is a black background and the model's lit in front of it, so the model's light and the background's dark, and we leave the white canvas there very long, our brain accepts that the relationship between what we've drawn and the white canvas somehow equals the same relationship as the light model against the dark background, and then it tries to run the math internally, subconsciously, that makes that work, and which of course it can't. And so then, then it kind of blows up the hard drive. One of the things that I think was very important for me to learn, uh, I don't practice it like I should, but um, you can't make a mistake, you can start over. You can scrape down, you can change it, you, you, you don't have to complete what it is you've started, it, but the minute you'd stop feeling good about it, then you've got to revisit that. Because what, what some of us, I think, tend to do is we get so invested in what we've done so far, you know, I really like the way I did that fingernail or that nose or, or whatever, and then we fall in love with it, like you say, and we can't see it clearly. So one of the things I've found very, freedom, very, very freeing is the ability to not be so invested to say, okay, it's all right to scrape it down, it's okay to start over, it's okay to take it off and never do it again, or um, just completely ignore it for a while. Sometimes I'll put a painting down for a year or two years and I'll pick it up and I'll see it completely differently. Do you have that same kind of sense or is, do you do oh, it, sure. approach it differently? Absolutely. I've gotten paintings back from galleries and when they come back, I thought it was pretty good when I shipped it out, <laughs> but the evil painting trolls attacked it while it was in the gallery, apparently. Yeah. And it came back to me, and I see all of these things that are wrong. And I've, the, the beauty of oil paint is that you can kind of sand off the big peaks and work over it. Right. And I've repainted paintings right on the same painting and then shipped them out again, and they sell immediately. So hopefully as you grow, you start to spot... Uh, errors and and you're uh, coming at it with a fresh eye. That's I think part of it. Uh, who who would you say are the influences, um, contemporary influences that um, impact you today in terms of their style of painting or what you've learned from them or perhaps uh, historical influences that have a lot of meaning to you. Um, influences for me have been Sargent. Zorn, Nikolai Fashion, uh, contemporary people, Richard Schmidt, of course. His writing, I've read A La Prima cover to cover probably five times. Uh, Dan Gerhardt's, I paint with Dan quite a bit. And he is, in my opinion, not only one of the best that's alive today, but one of the best of all time. Uh, so there's, you know, th th I get influenced by a lot of different people. It's like if you're a musician, uh, the way, if you're a rock musician, you learn by copying, you know, Bob Seger and then, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and others, and you, you pull from a hundred different musicians and, and it gradually gets incorporated and you learn all these different parts, something from one person. So I, it's the same way with painting. You know, I, I pick up a little nugget from David LaFell or a little nugget from... Carolyn Anderson or Harley Brown or, you know, hundreds of artists. You mentioned to me um, an artist that I don't hear about very often. Uh, we, we oftentimes hear of the Zorn and the Sargent influences, the fashion, but you, you were talking about Mucha last night and some of the design principles you've learned from him, which I assume you'll be sharing in your demonstration. But you want to talk about Mucha at all? Um, Muka was a phenomenal designer, and he's well known for the posters that he did, which sort of embody that, you know, the Sarah Bernhardt posters and then right. the job cigarettes and so on. You know the story of how he got that poster? Mm, not exactly. Well, he was, he was living in Paris and starving, and uh, Sarah Bernhardt decided to do a new show and needed a poster on Christmas Eve and all the people she contacted couldn't do it and somehow she encountered him and he said I'll do it and he did it and essentially he did it in the Art Nouveau style which really nobody had seen at the time 
and it completely made his career because of being associated with her. Yeah, I, I had not heard that story, but <laughs> so I he can got see lucky. that. He, and then he did a whole bunch of posters for her. Yes. And, and he basically invented that Art Nouveau style. Right. right. But the underlying principle, I have a, a little manual that he wrote on design, and it's basically the uh, ratio of two-fifths to three-fifths. So you can put a center of interest two-fifths from the left and three-fifths from the right, and it'll look kind of right. But then you can divide one of the spaces in two to three again, and two to three from the top, or you can put two above and three below, and it becomes this very open-ended, branching sort of way to design the pictorial space. But it has this internal logic, so it looks right, even though you can't tell exactly why it looks right. What do you hope to impart on the world? Uh, how do you want to be remembered, and what is important for people to remember about you? Hmm. That's an interesting subject. I, I haven't given any thought to that, what, what's important to be remembered about me. I would hope, I think, that uh, eventually somebody will think I was a pretty decent artist and that I wasn't a jerk and that uh, I was willing to share some of this. Mm -hmm. That's why I teach. I, uh, uh, one of my friends said, there's two reasons you should teach. One, you studied with great artists and you owe it to the world to pass that on, which I believe is true. And two, uh, it'll make you better. It may not help them so much, but it'll certainly help you, which, both of which I've found to be true. Uh, so, I, you know, I would have to give that a lot more thought. You know, the, the way the world remembers me is probably going to be mostly, I hope that my family <laughs> remembers me fondly and not as the guy that went off and locked himself in his studio and they never saw him too much. So, uh, I don't know if that's a great answer, but, you know. Well, it's coming from your heart. It is. That's what matters. So. Well, this has been very refreshing and a really good interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Well, that was William Schneider and Pastel Painting Secrets, and you can learn more at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, we have a special discount code for today only in the comments section. Thank you for watching. You can create some of the most beautiful paintings with pastels, but many artists have a hard time making their pastel paintings look just right. Pastel portraits are even more challenging, which is why we selected master artist William A. Schneider to show you the right way to use pastels to create realistic images in your portrait paintings. So if you've got background color, complement, and then discord somewhere near that center of interest, it will focus you in like a laser on the center of interest. Discovering how to select, apply, and blend colors will help you achieve an accurate representation of your model, whether from life or a photo. And Bill Schneider is a master at teaching this. So anyway, the question is, am I thinking about edges? To a certain extent, I am. I'm, I'm comparing everything to this sharpest edge, and I know that a form shadow, as it rounds out, is gonna have softer edges than a cast shadow, like the cast shadow of the nose. In this video, you will see Bill's best kept secrets and techniques for using pastels for portraits and we'll take you through a start to finish painting while explaining each step along the way. And so you can have somebody with one eye here and the other one down here and your brain will look at that and say, hmm, yeah, it looks pretty good to me, till the next day. That's why it's often, I often think that <clears throat> the evil painting trolls have come out and attacked my paintings at night. But it's really that I've got a fresh eye and I'm coming back and seeing this. Watching Bill, an excellent instructor and passionate artist, you'll soon find yourself loving pastels just as much as he does, even if you've never used them before. You'll be able to pause and practice each technique until you're ready to move to the next segment. You will have many aha moments as you see Bill reveal his techniques that bring pastel paintings to life. We did a light and shadow painting in pastel 
The shadow was bringing out the three-dimensionality of the form. So it's basically the difference between the value of the light and the value of the shadow. Having studied at the American Academy of Art in Chicago, Phil has been featured in many art magazines and journals and has received awards from prestigious art societies and organizations. You'll love Bill's artistic creativity and will treasure this video for years to come as you hone your own personal style for painting with pastels.